So greetings and a warm welcome to everyone. I'm Ritu Parna, the assigned moderator from Clarnet. It is my sincere pleasure to extend a heartfelt welcome to all the delegates joining us from across the distant parts of Africa. Today's special CAB marking the World Hypertension Day. We are indeed fortunate enough to have the valuable support of the esteemed doctors and I express my sincere gratitude to each one of you for dedicating your time to be with us today. So please allow me a moment to introduce our platform Clarnet. Clarnet is India's largest live digital CME platform, providing a space for the doctors to create and share innovative medical content. Now, I would like to extend a special welcome to today's distinguished speaker, Dr. Deepak Puri, sir, a prominent consultant. Sir is holding the degrees of MBBS from IGMC Shimla, MS and MCH in Cardiovascular Thoracic Surgery from PGIMR Chandigarh. He is the former assistant professor of CTVS. PGIMER Chandigarh, former additional director, CTVS at Fortis Mohali, and presently, sir, is a senior director of CTVS at Max Healthcare Mohali and global chairman of Cardiomers. Now, I would like to give, over, give you a brief overview of today's topic, which is management of hypertension. Hypertension is a leading preventable risk factor for cardiovascular diseases and all cause mortality worldwide. Lifestyle interventions are recommended to prevent, treat, and delay the onset of hypertension. Antihypertensive agents should be initiated for patients who have established CVD and blood pressure of more than or equal to 130 by 80 mm mercury. Initial therapies include at least one of four major classes and calcium channel blockers. Renal degenerative therapy is considered as an additional or alternative therapy for patients who have uncontrolled resistant hypertension or adverse effects of medications. So without any further delay, sir, I would like to hand over the session quickly to you to further enlighten us on this topic today. So over to you, sir. Kindly proceed with your talk. Thank you very much. Uh, very warm welcome to all the audience present here from India as well as from abroad, especially from South Africa. And Today, the topic that I am going to discuss is the comprehensive management of hypertension. And as we all know that hypertension is a problem which we are facing every day. And we are having a lot of complications related to hypertension. So today we will discuss the problems uh, one by one and we will discuss how we can prevent and treat hypertension. As we all know that uh, hypertension is the condition in which the blood pressure, which is the force exerted by the blood against the wall of the blood vessels increases. And we have uh, two uh, readings like one is the systolic blood pressure, which is by the pressure on the wall of the arteries during systole when the heart is contracting. And we have the diastolic blood pressure which is the pressure which is by the blood on the wall uh, during diastole. And when the pressure increases too much, uh, it causes endothelial damage and there may be complications like uh, myocardial infarctions and there may be uh, aneurysm or there may be stroke. So all these complications, they occur because of the high blood pressure. So uh, two decades ago, uh, this was the actual facts that almost half of the people with high blood pressure were not aware that they have high blood pressure. And those who were known hypertensive, only half of the people who were known to be hypertensive got treated. And even those who got treated, only half of them, the blood pressure was adequately controlled. So over the decades, then again, we have seen that now almost 46% of adults are hypertensive, uh, are not aware that they are hypertensive. And in America, around 18% of the Americans, they are hypertensive. And in Africa, 27% of Africans, they are hypertensive. And in the last two decades, we have seen that in the European and American region, uh, there is a 41% increase in the number of hypertensive patients, whereas there is only 144% increase in South, Eastern and Western Pacific regions. So there, it is almost 
more than three times more increase in these regions compared to America and Europe. Also, when we see the figures from India, it is uh, seen that 23% of the Indian population, they are hypertensive and only 14.5% of the individuals with hypertension are on treatment. And if you compare men with women, around 24% of the adults above the age of 15 years, they are hypertensive and 21% of the women, they are hypertensive. And it is seen that uh, if you compare the various religious population, the six are seen to be more hypertensive uh, compared to the Jains and Christians. And all these three communities, they have a higher in prevalence of hypertension compared to the other population in India. And also it is seen that in Punjab, 37% uh, of the men, they are hypertensive and 31% of women are hypertensive which are uh, very high and also uh, similar readings are seen in Kerala, 32% uh, of the men being hypertensive and 30% of the women being hypertensive, followed by Telangana and Karnataka. We have seen that the prevalence of uh, hypertensives in India between the age of 30 to 79 years, uh, it is seen that 37% of the diagnosed patients only 30% get properly treated and again uh, only 15% are controlled. And it is seen that the cardiovascular death due to high blood pressure is 51% in males and 54% in females. And the population taking high salt, 11 gram is the intake in male and 9 gram in females. And tobacco use is 42% in males and 14% in females. And also alcohol consumption is seen in 8% of the hypertensives in males and 2% of females. And physical inactivity is seen to be higher in females. So 44% of the hypertensive females, they are physically inactive. Whereas 25% of the males, they are physically inactive. And also it is seen that in the last decade, there has been a slight control in the prevalence of the hypertension both worldwide also and in India also but still cardiovascular diseases associated with hypertension remain the leading cause of death. So as we see that most of the uh, lifestyle diseases nowadays they have similar risk factors. So the main uh, the cause of uh, preventable death nowadays is tobacco use and other causes are obesity, alcohol use, and high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diet, physical and activity, and obesity. So it has been seen that these can lead to cardiovascular disease, cancers, chronic lung disease, diabetes. And also when a person has one of the diseases, the person is liable to get other diseases also because the risk of getting the other lifestyle diseases also increases proportionately and several studies have shown that a person who has cardiovascular disease is more likely to get cancer, more likely to, to be diabetic also and more likely to be hypertensive also. So it is also been seen that the number of risk factors as they go on increasing then the chances of getting cardiovascular disease also increases and hypertension along with smoking, obesity, increased cholesterol levels, diabetes, they all contribute to the rising number of cardiovascular patients. So when we see the rising blood pressure levels, we see that once the levels cross 140 systolic, the chances of getting stroke or a myocardial infarction, they increase deeply. So it has been seen as the systolic blood pressure keeps on increasing, the incidence of strokes steeply increases and once the level crosses 180, then the rise is even more steeper and also the incidence of myocardial infarction also keeps on increasing once the level goes above 140. So we have to be sure that what are the guidelines and cutoff points so that we can adequately diagnose hypertension. Out of the 37% diagnosed patients, 30% get treated 
and only 50% they are adequately controlled. The problem mainly lies that uh, most of the patients, they come to the physicians only when they are having complications. And other people, they don't undertake the preventive measures and they don't realize the importance of controlling blood pressure till they start getting severe complications or symptoms. And thereafter also, once the treatment is started, they are erratic and compliance is not that good. So that's why it causes the various complications which can prove fatal. So in 2011, we started a global trust called Cardiomergen. And the idea was to spread awareness about the comprehensive management of cardiovascular diseases. And we promoted the integrated approach to carry forward this comprehensive management. So we must emphasize that you have to start treatment from the primordial prevention when the risk factors, they have not started. And then we have to continue in the stage when already some risk factors starts coming. We have to control the risk factors in the primary prevention. And during these stages, we don't require medication, just unconventional methods and lifestyle control methods. They are adequate to control the onset of the disease. Once the disease crosses the level which is beyond control of these lifestyle control measures, then we have to diagnose it quickly. And then we have to have clear guidelines when to start the medical management. And once the medical management is going on, we have to make sure that it is adequately controlling the hypertension. And also, if it goes beyond control and it becomes a complicated hypertension or uncontrolled hypertension, then we have to go for interventions. Also, in the secondary hypertension, we have to identify what are the causes and then we have to go for suitable interventions to control them. And thereafter, we have to have a proper rehabilitation for the patient and we have to continue the prevention so that the problem does not arise again. We see that this is not a one-time process. This is a continuous journey throughout the life and we have to continue it at all stages if we have to give the comprehensive care. So first of all, I'll tell you, Basically, everybody knows that how to record a blood pressure, but still let's revise that the environment should be quiet and the patient should not have undergone any exercise or taken caffeine or any other like uh, should not have smoked half an hour before taking the blood pressure. And then he should rest for three to five minutes before we start taking the blood pressure. And the posture should be straight uh, with the back resting against the back of the chair and legs should be side by side and should not be crossed. And then we apply the cuff to the mid arm and the elbow should be resting on the table and the mid arm level cuff should be at the level of the heart. And also when we start taking the reading, if the reading is taken at home, then we should take two readings at one minute apart and then we should take the average of the two readings. And if we are recording in the hospital, uh, then we should take three readings. We ignore the first reading and take the average of the uh, next two readings. So once we have recorded the blood pressure, then we have to decide in which category the patient falls. So any blood pressure systolic less than 120 is considered normal and the diastolic blood pressure less than 80 is considered normal according to American Heart Association guidelines and if the blood pressure is 120 to 129 then it is called elevated and the diastolic is less than 80. The high blood pressure stage 1 is when the systolic blood pressure is 130 to 139 or the diastolic pressure is between 80 to 89. And the high blood pressure stage 2 is when the systolic blood pressure is 140 or higher or the diastolic blood pressure is 90 or higher. And hypertensive crisis is considered when the blood pressure in systole is more than 180 or 
or end if the diastolic blood pressure is more than 120. So once we have diagnosed the stage, then we must understand there are various factors that influence the blood pressure. So this includes our higher functions at the brain level and then we have the regulation at the kidney level and then we have apart from these we have genetic factors, we have lifestyle factors and we have environmental factors. So we have to be sure what are the factors that are influencing the rise in the blood pressure. So most of the patients may not have any symptoms and especially when the primary hypertension is there, it may be a silent killer. And in the secondary hypertension, there may be associated symptoms related to the underlying cause. And in an emergency, the patient may become confused, may be drowsy, may be having chest pain, may be breathless, may be having headache. So all these may be the underlying symptoms because of the high blood pressure. And some patients they have white coat hypertension. When they come to the hospital, their blood pressure rises, especially the systolic blood pressure. 30% of the people attending the hypertensive clinics may be having white coat hypertension. And also some patients, they have a masked hypertension. When the reading is recorded in the hospital or office, then it comes normal, but it may at other times may be higher side. So, the mast hypertension is more associated with cardiovascular risks. And also, when we talk about primary hypertension, it gradually occurs and uh, is associated with uh, rising age, obesity, high intake of salt, sedentary lifestyle. And luckily, it can be improved with the help of lifestyle changes, which may be weight reduction, adoption of salt restricted diet and more consumption of diet rich in fruits and vegetables which is known as the dash diet and also uh, by increasing the physical activity the moderation in the use of alcohol so all these factors they can help us in controlling the primary hypertension so unfortunately the prevalence of hypertension has been increasing as the incidence of uh, smoking and alcohol consumption is also increasing, especially increasing in the females also, which is a cause of worry. And also the incidence of sedentary lifestyle and obesity is also is on the rise. And smoking is one of the leading cause of preventable causes of high blood pressure as well as heart disease and also the leading cause of death nowadays. And it has been seen that the prevalence of smoking is highest in countries like China, India, Indonesia, Russia. And it is increasing in the females also. In part from causing high blood pressure, it can cause cancers in almost any organ of the body. And also it can cause stroke, it can cause blindness, it can cause uh, aortic aneurysms, it can cause uh, peripheral vascular disease, chronic lung disease and if we consider the top 8 causes of death, smoking is responsible for the top 6. So this is really a cause of worry and also when we talk about the dietary guidelines then we should encourage the intake of at least 5 servings of fruits and vegetables every day to all the individuals and also restrict the salt intake to less than 5 gram per day and also we should restrict the use of uh, soft drinks and junk foods and also avoid butter, eggs, egg yolk, chicken, fish can be taken but in moderation and uh, the saturated fat like ghee, ice cream, and bakery products, they should be avoided. When we talk about exercise, the guidelines say that at least 30 minutes brisk walk, five days a week, they are necessary. Uh, so at least 150 minutes of brisk walk every week is mandatory for a normal person. But for a cardiovascular 
patient it is increased to 40 minutes and all seven days of the week and also we can uh, either do uh, some uh, moderate intensity exercise or aerobic activities uh, for 25 minutes three days a week total amount of 75 minutes in a week and high intensity and isometric exercises we can do uh, two days a week and we should also be involved in like healthy activities like uh, playing any games doing some gardening walking from your parking to the office and also taking stairs instead of taking a lift cycling swimming all these activities they go a long way in reducing your blood pressure so when we talk about obesity now obesity can be divided into two types one is pear shaped which is more common in western countries and females and also we have apple shaped where the rest of the body is okay but the fat deposition is in the abdomen and the waist circumference is grossly increased so this is more dangerous and apple shaped obesity uh, is more associated with high blood pressure and diabetes and also increases the cardiovascular risk as well as risk of several cancers diabetes is also an associated risk factor and most of the diabetic patients they may be having other risk factors like diabetes or heart disease and high blood pressure also so it is very important to control diabetes also and dyslipidemia is the silent killer it is associated with hypertension and the, as the cholesterol keeps on depositing in the arteries the arteries become rigid and the more rigid the arteries the more will be the blood pressure so we have to make sure that we control dyslipidemia properly and nowadays stress is also an important cause which leads to high blood pressure and everybody is exposed to variable amount of stress which may be related to your workplace or it may be related to your family it may be related to your academics it may be related to your financial condition so everybody has different levels of stress and stress is unavoidable but we have to learn how to cope up with it a little amount of stress may be productive it may help us but long stress can lead to breakdown and it can not only cause mental breakdown but also it can lead to various complications like uh, diseases like hypertension and diseases like cardiovascular diseases so another important factor is uh, the we have seen very commonly that the blood pressure increases during the winters and most of the patients they have a higher blood pressure during winters uh, especially our cardiovascular patients their blood pressure starts increasing in the winters and we have to regulate the dose uh, before the onset of the winters and also uh, tell our patients to avoid exposure to extreme cold and also to keep the room warm so that their arteries they don't get constricted and their platelet stickiness also does not increase because maximum fatal heart attacks and stroke incidences they occur more during the winters so now we have seen that as the risk factor increases and at the same time as the blood pressure increases so the less the risk factor the less the blood pressure the lowest is the risk of getting complication related to hypertension especially the cardiovascular complications and as the number of risk factors increase and also as the blood pressure increases the risk of getting cardiovascular complication keeps on increasing and when there are more than 3 risk factors and also when the blood pressure rises above 140 then this becomes higher and higher and it reaches a stage once the blood pressure crosses 160 the risk becomes very high and also once the blood pressure crosses 180 then the risk is very very high so when we talk about simple management of hypertension this is a simple flow chart according to the american heart association guidelines so here you can see then the bp threshold for treatment initiation and follow up is shown here so if there is bp is 120 by 80 
then you just have to promote optimal lifestyle habits and continue the same and review the person after one year. But if the BP is elevated to 120 by 129 systolic and is up to 80 diastolic, then we promote non-pharmacological methods like nowadays we promote yoga, meditation, physical activity, dietary changes and music therapy etc. And then we reassess the person after 3 to 6 months. So if the rise in blood pressure is adequately controlled then we can continue with the same. However, if the blood pressure is above 130 and the diastolic blood pressure is above 80 then apart from the non-pharmacological therapy we have to decide whether to start treatment or not. So if there is a association of cardiovascular disease also then the treatment has to be initiated from the beginning apart from non-pharmacological therapies BP lowering medication has to be started from the beginning and then we have to recess the person every one month. But if there is no association of cardiovascular disease, then we can start the non-pharmacological therapies for six months. And if the BP doesn't get controlled within six months, then we can consider BP lowering medication. On the other hand, if the person comes to us in stage two with a blood pressure already above 140 by 90, then apart from non-pharmacological therapies, then we have to initiate BP lowering medication also and then keep on reassessing the patient periodically. So recently there have been the European Association has given their own guidelines and there are some changes which were not there with the American guidelines. So we will also discuss the controversial confusions and also the European guidelines. So according to the European guidelines, they consider hypertension definition more than 140 by 90. And if the BP is 120, they consider it as normal up to 129 systolic and 84 diastolic and high blood pressure is 130 to 139 and 85 to 89. And then uh, grade 1 is 140 to 159 systolic and 90 to 99 diastolic. Grade 2 is 160 to 179 systolic and 100 to 109 diastolic. And grade 3 is more than 180 systolic and 110 diastolic. So another difference is that in the American Heart Association guidelines, they don't consider beta blocker as the first line of treatment unless the patient is having ischemic heart disease or having heart failure. But in the European guidelines, they can consider beta blocker also as the first line of therapy. So when we talk about the antihypertensive drugs, then every drug has a different mechanism of action. We have the ACE inhibitors, which inhibit the aldosterone conversion into aldosterone 1 to aldosterone 2. And then we have the ARB, which inhibit the aldosterone 2. Then we have calcium channel blockers, which reduce the peripheral resistance. And then we have diuretics, which decrease the intravascular volume and thereby reduce the blood pressure. And also we have beta blockers, uh, which uh, are also used to decrease the heart rate and they are the one of the pillars of treatment in heart failure also. So which drug to use when we usually follow the guidelines and one by one we will discuss. Then we talk about uh, secondary hypertension. It can be because of uh, any problem that causing a decrease in the renal blood flow and it may be due to atherosclerosis or because of the vasculitis or aortic dissection or fibromuscular dysplasia which is seen in young women and the arteries become thickened. So the decrease in the blood supply increases the renin levels which causes retention of fluid and increases the fluid volume in the intravascular compartment leading to hypertension. And then there may be a suprarenal tumor or like tumors like pheochromocytomas uh, which can cause 
secondary hypertension. So, in the initial early stages, uh, it can be because of the co-optation of iota or maybe because of the renal parenchymal diseases and later on uh, the renovascular hypertension or the fibrovascular hypertension dysplasia may be seen. And also in later stages, the renovascular hypertension with atherosclerotic disease may be seen. And also there can be in the middle age, Cushing syndrome, pheocomocytoma can be seen uh, in the young as well as in the middle age. And also there can be primary aldosteronism. So the causes can be different in different stages. So in the atherosclerotic renovascular disease, the prevalence is 6 to 14%. And uh, the first choice treatment, we do a renal artery Doppler and uh, we may require a CT angio or a angio MR to diagnose the disease. And once the disease is diagnosed, then we start the antihypertensive treatment and quickly control the cardiovascular risk factors. And sometimes uh, we may have to, there's a tight renal artery stenosis, we might have to do a angioplasty or put a stent and then we have to control the cardiovascular risk factors to avoid cardiovascular mortality. And then we have the fibromuscular dysplasia in which again the patient may have early onset, patient may be severely hypertensive, may have migraines, pulsatile tinnitus and also renal artery doppler is the first of choice screening test. And we may require a CT angio or a angio MR. And again, we have to treat the hypertensive stage with the adequate drugs and angioplasty may be required. And then we have to treat the cardiovascular problems also. And because this may affect the medium-sized arteries and it can affect the renal as well as the cervical arteries. And often this is associated with arterial dissection and aneurysm formations. Then we have primary aldosteronism. Prevalence is 6 to 20 percent and this patient may have a resistant hypertension which may be grade 2 or grade 3. Patient may have hypokalemia and also the patient may have atrial fibrillation. So again we have to do a plasma aldosterone levels to diagnose and CT angio may be required or there are other tests like IV saline infusion test and there may be captopril challenge test or oral sodium loading test and treatment may require surgical intervention, adrenalectomy and adequate control of blood pressure. And also we have to at the same time make sure that we don't get the cardiovascular risk and mortality due to cardiovascular complications. Then we have pheochromocytoma and paraganglionoma and in this also the patient may have paroxysmal symptoms like a paroxysmal headache, sweating and palpitation and sudden increase in blood pressures and there is a large variation in the blood pressure and uh, cardiovascular manifestation may include uh, the patient may have arrhythmias, takasubo, cardiomyopathy, uh, MI, and then we have to do the we have to test the plasma or urinary metanephrines and also we have to maybe we require a CT or a MRI to diagnose the disease and then the treatment is surgical resection as well as adequate control of the hypertension and then we have the cushion syndrome and in the cushing syndrome there may be resistant hypertension and the patient may have a moon face thickening of the skin and then patient will be having gross weight gain with centripetal distribution. Patient may be also having diabetes and then we have to uh, do the screening. Uh, we have to do the pendexamethasone uh, suppression test, 24-hour urinary cortisol levels and then uh, treatment is uh, medical as well as uh, surgical treatment may be required. So, when a person comes to us uh, with a simple high blood pressure, so our first initiative is to make the person adopt a healthy lifestyle and then we have to start the drug treatment and our aim should be to control the blood pressure within the next 
three months. So usually, uh, most of the time nowadays, if the person has come with a blood pressure more than 140 by 90, uh, the patient uh, may have a adequate control with a single or a most likely a combination of a two drugs, uh, which may be AC inhibitor or ARB, as well as a diuretic, which may be a thiazide diuretic or a calcium channel blocker. And then in the next stage, we can add the second drug. If the person is also having a cardiovascular problem, then we can add the beta blockers. So once we start the dual combination therapy, the ACE inhibitor or ARB plus calcium channel blocker or thiazide diuretic, either of the two, 60% of the patient usually get control because of these two drug combinations. And if we need to add another drug, then the third drug choice may be a thiazide diuretic uh, or a calcium channel blocker may be added to the ACE inhibitor or ARB. And the patients usually have a 90% control of blood pressure. And if the still the blood pressure is not controlled, then we consider it as a resistant hypertension. And then we have to make sure what else to add. So if the person has a blood pressure of more than 180 systolic or more than 120 diastolic, then this can be divided into two stages. It may be urgency and there is no damage to the end organs or it may be an emergency where there is a, already a damage to the end organs, which are mainly the brain, the kidneys, the heart and the lungs. For a management of a simple resistant hypertension, uh, first we have to make sure we have the adequate lifestyle control, adequate salt control, then we optimize the three drug regime. And next step is that if still the BP is not under control, then we substitute optimal dose of either a thiazide-like diuretic or chlorothyridone or indapamide. Or if the, still there is not adequate control of blood pressure, then we can add the MRA antagonist like spironolactone or aplirinone. So how we achieve this lowering of the blood pressure is also depicted in this flow chart. So step by step, we keep on adding the drugs. But if the GFR is more than 30 ml per minute per 1.73 square meters, then we have to just first add the three drugs and we can add the thiazide like diuretic and then we add the spinal lactone or a beta blocker or a centrally acting agent or a we can ultimately resort to renal denervation but if the gfr is less than 30 then what we should do is instead of the thiazide diuretic we can add the loop diuretics and also if still it doesn't control, then lower thalidone or we can add beta blocker or centrally acting agent. So next we come to the hypertensive patients who have established cardiovascular disease. So this is very important. And every day we see patients with cardiovascular disease having hypertension. We start the treatment step one by ACE inhibitors or ARB and we can add beta blockers. And next, if the patient is having angina, we can have the calcium channel blockers. And without angina, we can add the thiazide diuretics. So we have a segment of patients who have a heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. Uh, for this, ARNI has now emerged as the drug of choice. So this is a combination of Sacubitril and Valsartan. And we have seen excellent results in patients uh, having heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And apart from ARNI, the other three pillars of treatment for uh, heart failure are the beta blockers, the SGLT2 inhibitors, and the MRA. And we can add diuretics uh, to maintain the fluid balance whenever required. And then we have a group of people who have hypertension and have heart failure uh, with a preserved ejection fraction. So in these patients, uh, ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blockers or 
thiazide diuretics, we can add beta blockers plus SGLT2 inhibitors from the beginning. And if still it doesn't get controlled, then maybe we can uh, add RNA later on and we can uh, also use MRA. So another group of patients who present with a st acute stroke and they are having hypertension. So it can be either a hemorrhagic stroke or a ischemic stroke. So if there is a hemorrhagic stroke, then within six hours from the onset of the symptoms, uh, we have to start BP lowering to achieve a target of less than 140 by 90 by IV therapy. And if the BP is less than 220, we can resort to a slower and moderate BP reduction and we can achieve the target of less than 140 by 90 after several hours. But if the BP is more than 220, then we can carefully lower the BP to less than 180 over several hours with IV therapy. And then we prefer to intensively lower the blood pressure to 140 by 90 for improving the recovery. On the other hand, we have ischemic stroke patients and these patients, uh, if they are eligible for IV thrombolysis or mechanical thrombectomy, then uh, we have to lower the blood pressure to less than 180 by 105 and maintain it for at least the first 24 hours after thrombolysis. And if the BP is less than 220 by 120 and patient is not eligible for IV thrombolysis or mechanical thrombectomy, then we can resort to reducing the blood pressure in the next 72 hours. So there is no need to go for drastic steps to reduce the blood pressure. But if the BP is more than 220 by 120, then we should moderately reduce the blood pressure about 15% with IV therapy during the first 24 hours based on clinical judgment. So there is another group of patients who have got uh, kidney disease, chronic kidney disease as well as high blood pressure. So in these patients, uh, we have to see whether the GFR is more than 30 ml. Then we can go for the standard three drug in which the ACE inhibitors for ARB plus calcium channel blockers and thiazide diuretics are used. And in if still it doesn't get control, the next stage is we add the third drug and if the still it doesn't get contained, then we add spinolactone or MRA, beta blockers, centrally acting agents. But if the GFR is less than 30, then instead of hazard diuretics, we can use loop diuretics. And in the next stage, we combine to three drugs. And then in the next stage, if still it doesn't get control, then we add chlorothalidone and we can add beta blocker or centrally acting agents. So with that, I come to the conclusion of my talk. And as we all know that hypertension is emerging as a silent killer that increases the risk of a patient having stroke and heart disease, which are the leading cause of death. And we have to control the blood pressure once it crosses 130 systolic and 80 diastolic. And once crosses 140 by 90, then we have to strictly control the blood pressure. And usually patient may not have any symptoms and the treatment includes lifestyle changes. They are the very important part of the treatment. So first we should resort to lifestyle changes. And if still the blood pressure is not controlled, then only we add the antihypertensive medication, but at the same time, we have to continue lifestyle changes at all stages. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir, for your comprehensive talk. It was really, very really lucid and informative. So, with all your permission now, can we move ahead with the questions? Yes, definitely. Uh, thank you, sir. Ongoing research is being conducted in the field of hypertension. So, there are a lot of research is being conducted in the field of hypertension because there are few areas which are still having some confusions and especially uh, what is the cutoff like whether we should start treating blood pressure uh, once it rises uh, above 120 systolic or should we wait till the blood pressure crosses 130 or should we wait till the 
blood pressure causes 140 and also like uh, what is the ideal blood pressure in the elderly population like once the patient is above 65 years once the patient crosses uh, 80 years and also we have to do a lot of research on the control of blood pressure in heart failure patients and uh, especially patients having hyperkalemia or uh, because most of the antihypertensive drugs in heart failure as well as the renal failure patients the most dreaded complication is hyperkalemia and many physicians they uh, stop the antihypertensive drug because the patient is having constant hyperkalemia we are uh, looking forward for drugs which can adequately control the hyperkalemia so that we don't have to reduce the dose of the antihypertensive drugs as well as uh, we don't have to withdraw any antihypertensive drug because uh, most of the patient when we withdraw the drug then the patient ultimately the failure is worsened and the patient they go into a constant cycle of uh, multiple hospital admissions and readmissions and gradually keep on deteriorating and ultimately they die what key points should be covered when educating a patient about hypertension and its management so the main key points that should be covered while educating a patient about hypertension is that lifestyle control is very important at all stages and we have to adequately control diet we have to make sure we have adequate physical activity in our daily lifestyle uh, we should avoid smoking we should avoid alcohol abuse and we should uh, control our cholesterol levels we should control stress and we should adopt uh, healthy de-stressing methods we can just take help of uh, music therapy unconventional methods like yoga regular walks gymming under supervision and also we should also make sure uh, we remain more physically active uh, we should avoid prolonged sitting and we should regularly monitor our blood pressure and we should take medication according to medical advice and whenever we require a specialist advice we should be referred in time we should also take care during winters about maintenance of temperature avoiding exposure to extreme cold temperatures and also we should down regulate or up regulate our drug doses according to the blood pressure levels instead of uh, totally stopping the drug or taking overdose we should take advice from a qualified physician so that we can maintain adequate level of blood pressures at all times so thank you very much sir it was thank really you. very lucid and informative presentation as well as thank you once again for answering all the queries of our doctors so thank you and I would also like to thank all the participating doctors for their continuous participation at our platform and sharing such valuable insights and requesting you all to suggest any other different topic based on this particular speciality and we would be very glad to conduct a session on our platform with your suggested topic and uh, so before we finally conclude any conclusive remarks for the uh, for our African audience yeah definitely because when I was going through the statistics uh, I found that the uh, privilege of hypertension in African population is uh, on the higher side so uh, we should uh, take effort and uh, uh, we should uh, adopt a healthy lifestyle right from the early stage in life uh, right from childhood and uh, there should be adequate uh, knowledge about uh, preventive measures and also about uh, adequate control of uh, high blood pressure and this can avoid cardiovascular complications and renal complications as well as complications related to the brain and uh, complications like stroke. So this will improve the health of uh, African population and also have a better lifestyle, better health span and a better lifespan. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So with all your permission, I would like to conclude the session over here and looking forward to host you again. Thank you so much, sir. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.